All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are back in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, beginning at verse 22 this morning. And as you see, the title there, The Dividing Choice, is, is about division and making a choice one way or another. Uh, spoiler alert, it's for God or against God. That's the choice. So... so many ways. But let's start with the passage. What's that next slide? That'll help me focus my brain. There we go. Here's the story of Matthew 12, 22 through 37. So in this uh, passage, Jesus heals a man and casts out a demon and the same guy. And uh, the Pharisees, the religious establishment, give, say that he is using the power of Satan to cast out demons. And this is also where Jesus says, you know, <clears throat> all sins will be forgiven except for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's not forgiven. <clears throat> Thanks, I need to do that too. <clears throat> Imagine how bad that would have been with the microphone on. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it's just the like the change in the weather or whatever. This nagging little bit of phlegm. All right, so Matthew 12, 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him. So the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Father, thank you. Uh, as we get into this passage, open our hearts, Lord, to receive the message, but also to understand uh, what's going on in this story, um, but also what it means for us today. Because there is division, there are choices. We need your help making the right ones. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this guy's got a double uh, whammy, right? He's possessed and he's also blind and mute. Now whether the demon is the one that caused that or whether it's uh, some other problem, but somehow uh, this man has let a demon into his life uh, and he's being impressed by him and Jesus heals him. It doesn't say how he does, it just says he heals him. And so that the man is spoke and saw and all the people were amazed. Can this be the son of David? Well. So a few things. First off, uh, physical, miraculous healing, speaking and hearing again. Uh, spiritual healing, the demon is gone, cast out. And the people recognize these as signs of what they were expecting, the Messiah. And so when they say son of David, that's a term, a messianic term. Messiah ben David means Messiah, the son of David. So when they say the son of David, it's not just like, oh, he's in the family of David. It's like, no, this is the guy that we're looking for because you know, our prophets tell us, when the deaf hear and the mute speak and demons are cast out, that's what this is, the son of David. So they're like, you know, is this really the guy? And then in verse 24, some Pharisees were there too, and they said, it says, when the, uh, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. So, they don't just say, well, you know, there might be some other things to tell us he's the son of David. They say, nope, not only is it not the son of David, but it's evil. It's Satan doing work. That's how he's casting out these demons. Uh, so they give his credit as miracles to the enemy. Verse 25, knowing their thoughts, he, Jesus, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. That's where Lincoln got it. Oh. No city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. So, like, there's a logical, illogical logical fallacy, uh, their response, right? And he's like, if 
if one is fighting against oneself, then both are losers. I mean, which means you're a double loser. So if, if Satan is using his power or letting people use his power to reduce his power, because by that man being demon oppressed, Satan has power over him. So if Satan's saying, oh yeah, yeah, hey, cast him out, he's really reducing his influence and his power in the world. And, and it goes beyond that, right? Jesus says, look, any, any I mean, he, he gives the broader example. If a kingdom or a nation, say like our nation, uh, today, but certainly in 1860s was divided, we ended up having a civil war. I mean, we almost lost everything right? we could have. That, that, you know, when you have a nation fighting against itself, it's not like one nation against another, that nation is the double loser, no matter if you win or lose. And so if a kingdom is fighting against itself, if a family's fighting against itself, a church, a community, if anybody is fighting against themselves, then it's the big loser. So obviously it's not going to be Satan fighting against himself because that just reduces his power. It doesn't make any sense. And he's like, and you guys, you Pharisees, you have sons that are exorcists. They cast out demons just like I did. So how do they do it? Are you saying that your sons who are exorcists are agents of Satan? Probably not. They recognize that it's the Spirit of God that casts out demons, and so they're going to judge you because you're making the wrong choice. And then he says in verse uh, 28, but if, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Simple statement. The people, is this the son of David? Well, let's see. People are healed, demons are cast out. Mm, yeah, the, the kingdom of God is upon you and you're not recognizing it. But worse than that, you're choosing to reject it completely. If Jesus says, you know, if I'm doing things that only God can do, then the kingdom of God is now. He continues on. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Now, that makes sense, right? And I, I finally studied this enough to recognize, because like when I first read this, first reading the Bible, New Christian, I was thinking, you know, well, the, he's talking about Satan entering the person's house and plundering and home. But no, because Beelzebul literally means Lord of the house. In the Greek, it's to Beelzebul, meaning the Lord of the house. And so the house makes a perfect metaphor because Jesus says, you know, you're not going to truly, you're not going to break into a house and steal things unless you do something to either uh, avoid or eliminate the homeowner in essence. And so if, if you've gone into a strong man's house, Lord of the house, you can't defeat him unless you're stronger than him. And only God is stronger than Satan. So Obviously, I'm stronger than Satan, Jesus says, because I'm plundering his house. I'm taking away the people that he has held captive through demon possession. And then he throws down the challenge there. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, in Mark chapter 4, this is the... Uh, um, unforgivable sin, I think is what it's called there, blasphemy against the Spirit. Uh, the only sin that's not forgivable is not seeking forgiveness from God, basically. Uh, whoever is not with me is against me, whoever does not gather, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. <clears throat> Pick a side, basically. Choose whom you're going to serve. Are you going to follow God and recognize when God's at work and recognize when the kingdom's here, or are you going to reject Him? And if you do reject Him, that's what can't be forgiven. You can speak ill of Jesus, you can do all kinds of sins, as long as you 
seek forgiveness. But that blasphemy or speaking against the Holy Spirit is basically saying God's not real, God's not at work, denying and rejecting God. And that's the thing, you can't be forgiven if you don't seek forgiveness. Then he wraps it up. Speaking of trees. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So, literally everything is a choice uh, for good or evil. Uh, you either choose to be going towards God, or choose to be moving away from Him. And choices have consequences. Good choices means you have good consequences. Bad choices means bad consequences. The fruit of your life is ripe and will be harvested, judged on Judgment Day. Uh, by your words regarding what you believe about Jesus, shall you be justified or condemned. Right? I mean, who here, uh, hopefully no one uh, under the age of 10, has said a swear word in your life? Maybe some of you over the age of 10 have never said a swear word in your life. Because, you know, I mean, we're taught in the Ten Commandments in Sunday school uh, where it says, um, I know this one, but uh, <laughs> no swearing, right? That's what we're taught. But it's not taking the Lord's name in vain. That's what the commandment said. But we're taught no swearing because we're choosing to modify children's behavior, which is not a bad thing. I mean, we want them to be upright citizens and not using swear words. But, um, but if you think about that, for every time you've said a swear word or said something or cursed someone or something, you're like, oh, I'm going to be judged for all those things. Yes, and um, that's not going to affect your salvation, right? It's not going to be, well, geez, you know, this many times you said that word, uh, I don't know, that's, that, that's past the limit. Sorry, you're not, you're not in. No, by what you say about Jesus, do you say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior? Or do you say, Jesus is just some good teacher that, you know, died pointlessly? It's that choice. If you do say, Jesus is Lord and Savior, then you're not perfect initially, but God is working to make you that way. And so, I mean, right out of high school, I was a sailor. Okay? If you didn't know, then they taught you how to swear like a sailor. It was a class in boot camp. <clears throat> Not really. But, you know, the, the, if it were just those words that I were judged upon, then I, sh I mean, this church would be burning down around me, for sure. I mean, me with it. But it's that choice, those words, that fruit of following Jesus that we're known. So, uh, verse 30, right? Look at verse 30 here. Uh, whoever is not against me, let's see, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. So that's seemingly the opposite of what it says in Mark chapter 9, because maybe you've heard that, right? Whoever is not against us is for us. That's what he says. In fact, I'll read it for you. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. Uh, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives, a cup of water, gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So there's different things there. In, in you know, Matthew, the people were saying, hey, you're doing this by demons. So um, he says, whoever is not with me is against me. But in Mark, they're not following him, but they're with him because they recognize the power of his name, and by the power of his name, they're casting out demons. So he says in Mark, the one who is not against us is for us. But the guys in Matthew were against him. So that's why 
it's a little bit opposite. The context is different. The people recognize him for who he was and were doing things in his name. They literally were for Jesus, unlike the Pharisees who attributed his power to Satan. So, what we see from uh, this story in Matthew, or what we can draw from it, a couple of things. The first one being, um, the division among men is victory for the enemy. Because just like, Jesus, just like Jesus was saying, a house divided cannot stand. So if people are divided, uh, then it's victory for the enemy. Because it's easier to pick you off one by one than as a whole group. The basic unit of society is the family, father, mother, kids, right? Uh, the next unit is the clan, which is a larger family unit. Neil and I were just talking, he just buried his, the last aunt, was it, you said, of how many kids? Uh, eight kids. Yeah. Eight kids. Yeah, so, uh, you know, big families. I know, Phil, you came from a big family, too. That's, that's, that's the bigger family unit um, from the, you know, mom and dad and kids. So uh, then you get local, regional, state, national communities, and then finally international community. But each community is built on the previous smaller one. And it's much easier to tear a family apart than it is to tear a nation apart. But once you start tearing apart the families, the fabric that is, the, is you know, woven together to make the nation is more fragile. And again, that's victory for the enemy. Now, I heard uh, this thing, which I like because I qualify for it, but a man's fourth greatest uh, blessing is grandchildren. Fourth, fourth greatest, you say. Well, yeah, his first is a relationship with God. Second is a godly wife. Third is children. But when you have grandchildren, you become a biblical patriarch. Yeah, because you've got that clan going. Similar to society's building blocks, the path to patriarchy is by building each step before it. Like Jesus said, if you want to build a house on a firm foundation so that it doesn't fall. Satan's goal is everything under his rule. He doesn't want strong families. He doesn't want strong communities. He doesn't want strong nations. He wants them weak enough that he can rule over them and control them and make them do what he wants. And so he tries to tear things apart at the lowest level. So a division among men, again, is victory for the enemy. In fact, you know, on this piece of paper, two sides, if it were, mm, let's see, standard formatting, 12-point font, uh, double-spaced paragraphs, I get about 250 words on a page. So this would be about 500 words, right? Now what is it? 250. 125. 62 and a half. 31 and a quarter. See what I mean? The smaller it is, the less it is. And that's what Satan's doing. Uh, and even in this passage, he's doing amongst God's people. I mean, they were all children of Abraham, Israelites. They were all worshiping the one true God. And yet even amongst them, when the Messiah came, they rejected. There was division. So unified social units build societies, or in other words, strong families build strong communities. Otherwise, they become divided and become a playground for the devil. So the second thing from this passage, that we're given a clear choice. We can see Jesus for who he is, Lord and Savior, or we can reject him uh, like the Pharisees did. And so choose whom you will serve. God doesn't force people to follow him or to believe in him or even to recognize him. Uh, he puts it all out there for people to see for themselves, but ultimately it is their choice. And that's, you know, like Romans chapter 1 where he's like, Look at creation. Uh, there's, you can't help if you seriously, with an open mind, look at creation, um, deny that there's a creator. And yet, people do deny that there's a creator. And they worship the creation versus the creator. So, God gives you all the evidence, but he doesn't force you to believe in him or to follow him. Jesus pointed out the facts of the Pharisees and made it clear that this was the ultimate choice. Like you, you choose all kinds of things, you can do all kinds of things, but if you reject God, then there's 
no forgiveness for you. The good news is you have right up until the end of this life to do it, but better if you don't wait. So when you see uh, God's Spirit at work, believe in Jesus or reject it and be forever separated from God's kingdom. That means eternity in hell. We're given many choices in life, right? Many of them, maybe most, can be changed or fixed. Uh, make a wrong turn, well, you just make three more rights and you're going back the way you were before. You can change that. Put on the wrong shirt, you can change your shirt. Some choices you can't change once made, they're permanent. You, know, you can adopt a dog and then realize, well, this was dumb, and give the dog back. But you have a kid and that's for life. It doesn't matter, you know. I, <laughs> I, I told my kids growing up, more so my son uh, than my daughter, but she heard it, I'm sure, growing up. I'm like, look, kid, when you're 18, you can get a job and move out. You can join the military and move out. You can go to college and move out. But you notice all those involve moving out when you're 18. I forgot to tell them and not come back. <laughs> fair is fair. I mean, my mom let me come back a couple of times, so it's only fair that I should let him. And I did, but now he's great off on his own. Actually, both of them off on their own, so. Yeah, so uh, that kid is yours for life, though. They're still my kids, even if they don't live with me. But not having a kid, making that choice, that's also for life. So that's why it's so important to choose to follow God, because his way is always best. We may not understand it, we may not think it is, but his way is always best, and he will guide us into making the right choices in all those other situations. The choice is clear for or against God. So we want to avoid division, uh, choose God, and then finally examine the fruit of your life. Every tree is known by their fruit, he says. So, you know, imagine if you put off choosing Jesus until you're on your deathbed. You show up in heaven with, I don't know, mustard seed? Whereas if you're blessed, and some of you are, kids who have chosen to follow Jesus at a young age, people who were uh, born Christian, no such thing, but, uh, and, and have followed Jesus your whole life, you know, or at least been part of the church, well, you, you know, you're gonna show up with a convoy of semis full of spiritual fruit that you've produced in your life, right? Um, you gotta show that next picture for me, thanks. So at our first house, uh, we had a silk tree, didn't we? Or were they just in the neighborhood? I seem to remember we had one, because anyway, beautiful, isn't it? They were, man, in the springtime, it's just several months out of the year, you get these nice, beautiful, fluffy flowers. Look at the, the leaf structure there, all these little tiny leaves, just great, beautiful. During those few months, right? And then the rest of the time, it's a total mess. That stuff, those flower petals, petals, their little silk threads floating everywhere, tens of thousands of bazillion leaves all over your yard, just a mess. And you know what? No fruit. Like that's, that's what it produces. Beauty for a bit and then nothing. We also had a little peach tree. Nice peaches. Guess which one I ended up liking most? The one that produced the good fruit. Beauty is great, but it is fleeting. Fruit that lasts, like peaches. I still remember those peaches. The tree wasn't even that big yet. But. Every one of us produces something in life, right? If you're a third grade boy at Awana, well, you might produce gas. Actually, you will. True story, proven fact. More than goods and services, though, we produce something intangible. And yet, it's so valuable that there's a line item for it on companies' balance sheets. It's called goodwill. You know, you can sell products that are good and they, you know, the, the, the tangible value of them is only X amount, but if your customer service is great and everybody loves you and you have great customer loyalty, your goodwill is a, an intangible, you can't touch it, 
but it is of value to the business. The stuff in your business might be only worth $100,000, but that goodwill, the good name, is worth even more. And so that's the same way we are, right? We have goodwill. We're producing, hopefully, goodwill in our life. Perhaps you've heard of the social credit score the Chinese Communist Party uses to track people, right? Using their cell phones. What? Yeah. Where you go, who you spend time with, how you spend your money, what you look at online, what you say in social media, all of these things go towards your social credit score. Of course, they use it for controlling people, not for good. But similarly, God keeps track of all. He knows all and he keeps track of all. I say similarly, only of that, that he keeps track. He's not trying to control you. He's just measuring things. Every good thing you say, every bad thing you say, on Judgment Day there will be a reckoning. But don't worry, that doesn't affect your salvation, right? What affects your salvation is do you truly believe that Jesus died in your place for your sins on the cross? That by believing in him you are forgiven of your sins, right? Trusting in Jesus, putting your faith in Jesus, that is salvation. But we will all stand before God, right? And like I said, if you made that choice and decided to follow Jesus, then that's this tracking of your fruit only affects your rewards in heaven. Uh, as we've read through Revelation, we've you know, seen people bowing down in worship. We've seen people casting crowns at the feet of the Lord. That's what those crowns are. They're the good deeds, the rewards that we get for doing God's work in this life. However, no time like the present to evaluate your life and decide, is your fruit good or is it evil? And how do you want to be remembered to change that? And that's the choice we make, a dividing choice. People will say, God's not real, don't want anything to do with him, got to live my life for me. And they will have their time. Or we choose to recognize Jesus for who he is. King of kings, Lord and Savior, as we follow him. And we follow him by not just making that decision, but choosing every day and everything to follow, honor, and glorify him. That is the dividing choice. So, thank you, God, again, for this passage, for your word. Help us, Lord, we've not made that choice yet, to make that choice, to decide to follow Jesus. Right here, right now. It's as simple as admitting we're sinners. Indeed, we are. We do things that are wrong, think things that are wrong, say things that are wrong, contrary to your holy and perfect nature. And for that, there will be judgment. But if we believe that Jesus took that judgment, dying on the cross in our place for our sins, we will be saved. And then we just confess, Jesus, you are my Savior. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to follow you. Help me to produce good fruit that honor and glorifies God. When I don't, help me to accept that, confess it, and forget it. And to get back on track following you. Don't let the enemy have any foothold in my life, Lord. May your kingdom come you be honored and glorified because you are worthy. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.